we are taking the first maturity being called doctrinal maturity. Hallelujah. Amen. This is not the Bible school. <laughs> so don't be afraid. Hallelujah. But I'll be zeroing on the basic Bible doctrines. But before I move further with today's message, when we treated the growth pillars, I gave something to help us to remember the growth pillars one by one. And today too, I want to give a mnemonic for the maturity beam so that we can easily remember. God is not interested in the mnemonic. He's not interested in the thing you used to memorize. He's interested in you memorizing his word. And we can use certain things to remember. Hallelujah. So please listen carefully and write it down. You get all the 10 in what I'm about to share. You can call it a, a poem. <laughs> so listen carefully. It goes this way. CDM. CDM reproduces matured and perfect leaders who are kingdom warriors and kingdom minded that finish well. I'm taking it again. CDM reproduces matured and perfect leaders who are kingdom warriors and kingdom minded that finish well. I take it again. CDM reproduces matured and perfect leaders who are kingdom minded warriors that finish well. Hallelujah. So you can find character maturity, doctrinal maturity, ministry maturity, and maturing the human spirit, perfection in Christ-likeness, Christian leadership, kingdom expansion, kingdom warfare, and then finishing well. We have the reproduces, it stands for fruitful, fruitfulness and reproduction. This are we okay? So all the thing is in this morning. I hope you got it. Wonderful. So today, let's look at what at all we've lived on maturity. So let's look at what is doctrine. What is doctrine? Now, the word in English, doctrine, is gotten from the Latin, which is doctrina. Doctrina. And this means to teach. Out of the doctrine, that same word, we have doctor. So you are an expert in a field. But in the New Testament Greek, there are basically three words that are used for doctrine. The first one is didache. Didache. Don't mind about the pronunciation. We are not used in Greek. Didache. The second one is logos. And then the third one is didascali. Now it's interesting to take a critical look at this theory because the way they are used in the Bible brings out a certain understanding. So in Matthew chapter 7 from verse 28 to 29, when they heard the words of Jesus, they were astonished. And they, he, he, he taught with one, as one with authority and not like the scribes. The teaching with authority, the word there, the word there is didache, authoritative teaching. In Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 1, say that we should leave the elementary principles of Christ and move on into maturity. The elementary teaching, the teaching used there is logos. But in didache, we realize in Matthew, chapter 28 from verse 20, saying, teaching them to obey, that teaching them is to hand over an authoritative teaching. 
So authoritative teaching are teachings from Jesus Christ and his apostles in Acts chapter 2 from verse 42. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And that's didache. So it is authoritative teaching. Logos is to teach, to deliver a teaching. And didaskalia is to hand over a set of authoritative teaching. This, this is doctrine. Now, let me put a definition to what we really mean by Christian doctrine. Christian doctrine is the authoritative biblical teaching on any subject as interpreted by Jesus and his apostles. I take it again. Christian doctrine is the authoritative Bible teaching on any subject as interpreted by Jesus and his apostles. Now, if this is Christian doctrine, then when we say doctrinal maturity, what do we mean? Doctrinal maturity is that stable and consistent knowledge, interpretation, understanding, obedience, and teaching of the Bible like Jesus. So in other words, having the same attitude that Jesus had towards the Bible is Christian or doctrinal maturity. Having the same thinking, having that same mind, maturing to that standard of Jesus in his understanding, in his teaching in his knowledge and his obedience of Bible. Hallelujah. This is doctrinal maturity. Now why do we even have to worry our head? You know many people see discussing doctrine like this. Let me borrow one of Kelvin's words. Like Eric Merrill. Is that it? It is, it is irritating. You don't want to discuss it with somebody because it's like having an argument with somebody and you become so tired after having the argument. You, it's, you, you, people don't want to delve in it. They say, Oh, you believe in Jesus. I also believe in it. Believe in what you believe. I also believe in it. And we go. Because we don't want to really engage because it's tiring. You see, in the writing of it, you see, in writing of book, there's no many end. There's no end. And much study is worrying some to the point. You see, it's a, 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 a So people don't like to talk about doctrine. But it is important that we talk about doctrine. Hallelujah. The first reason why we need to talk about doctrine is because Jesus was a man of doctrine. If we we have to, if we, we want to, be like him, then we must master doctrine. Let's look at these interesting verses in the Bible. In John chapter 3 from verse 2, Nicodemus was telling Jesus that we know that you are a teacher come from God. We know, we the teachers. Now, you need to sit back a little when you read this because Nicodemus, in the introduction that was given in the verse 1 of John chapter 3 showed that he was not an ordinary man. He was a Pharisee. He was one of the big men in that sect. And he is a teacher. He is a teacher of the law. So it's like a professor of, of, of the Bible has come to Jesus and said, you are a teacher. Means that professors acknowledge that you are their professor. Hallelujah. He is a teacher of teachers. His doctrine is about the Pharisees. He was a man of doctrine. Oh. Okay, let's read for effect's sake. John chapter 3, verse from, 2. You read from verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Yes. Rabbi, 
We know that you are a teacher come from. We the, we the teachers, we the Ugontiacs, we realize that you are a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Unless God is with him. That's the Pharisee. Listen to what they said in Matthew chapter 7 from verse 28 to 29. Let's read this one. Matthew 7 from yes. verse 28 and 29. Yes. And, it was, and so it was. Yes. When Jesus had ended this saying, He entered the sermon on the mount. He ended the whole, the end of the matter is this. And then the people were astonished. And they said what? That the people were astonished at his teaching. Yes. But he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribe. Now his teaching is above the Pharisees. Now his teaching is above the scribe. Now when we say a scribe, you don't understand. Read Ezra and see how he put his two together. He said that he's a writer of writers. A scribe. Now to go. The Bible is saying that he taught, he said, not as the scribes. They didn't say he taught as the scribes. He did not teach like this. The, the, the teaching of the scribes were minute, were under, were below the teaching, the doctrine of Jesus. Now, for us, he couldn't face him. Scribes couldn't face him. Who else will come? Let's read Matthew chapter 22 from verse. 20, 34, let's read from verse 34. So the Pharisees realized that he had conquered the scribe. So a, a lawyer rose out of them. Matthew 22, verse 34. Yes. But when the Pharisees heard that, he had silenced the Sadducees. He had silenced the Sadducees. That now the Sadducees, our brother Tom labored on it last Sunday. Okay? They are one of the sects in Israel. And they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. He silenced them. They gathered together. Yes. Then one of them. You are reading now to verse 37. Verse 35. Then one of them, a lawyer. A lawyer. Asked him a question. Yes. Testing him and saying, Yes. Teacher. Teacher. Which is the great, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him. Jesus said to him. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And this is the second. It's like. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. Jesus, how? It's okay. You see, it takes a level of maturity to be able to sum up the whole New Old Testament into this. There were many laws. There were many customary instructions. There were many things. But Jesus, because of his maturity in doctrine, was able to sum up the whole word of God from Deuteronomy chapter 6 from verse 5. Jesus was a man of doctrine. If we have to, if we want to be like Jesus, we need to mature. We need to mature in doctrine. Hallelujah. My second reason is so that we need to mature in doctrine so that we are able to spot error and be able to stand against error. In the Matthew chapter 22 from verse 29, Jesus told a whole set, a whole system of understanding and teaching and said to them that you err because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. We need doctrinal maturity in an age where there's so much teaching, different kinds of teaching. Some of them, when I hear them, I want to fall. <sighs> Somebody was saying that if you want to pray and God will hear you, you have to be naked and go and walk in some place. Hallelujah. So that we are able to spot error and stand against it. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 from verse 1, he says that the Spirit expressly says that the, in the last days many will depart from the faith and they will give ear to deceiving spirit and doctrines of demons. How do you detect doctrine of demons if you don't have the standard, the checker of the word of God matured in you? In Galatians chapter 2 from verse 11, Peter 
sorry, Paul, stood against Peter because he stood to be blamed. You see, because what you believe in affects how you behave. So he was very confused whether he should dine with the Gentile. And he stood against him that it is not so. They qualify for the same salvation that we qualify. Doctrine. So that you are able to spot error. It gives you boldness. How can a Peter, when did you come? When, when did you come? But when you have the truth, hallelujah, you stand up against giants. You stand up against mountains, and people, big men. He said you shouldn't take thought of what to say when you are called before the authority. But he himself, the spirit will speak to you. One day I was speaking to somebody on a very a topic. And as soon as I wanted to mention one Bible verse, I was about to say, that is the only reference in the Bible. And another Bible verse slapped me and said, I'm here. I'm sorry I can't share with you the topic. And I said, wow. So when I was talking to the person, I said, oh no, there's another Bible verse here. It is doctrinal maturity. You are able to spot error and stand against it. But tied to this, is this is what I'm about to share. Please allow me. In doctrinal maturity and in identifying error, there must be that maturity also to be able to line up people onto doctrine or sound doctrine. It is very sad to see that sometimes in trying to attack error, doctrinal error, we throw the baby with the bathwater away. There are people who are genuinely, I mean, they genuinely love God. But it's just that they think that you can actually pray to angels. You see? So if you don't have that maturity of Priscilla and Aquila in Acts chapter 18 from verse 24, you are not able to take an Apollos and say to him that you know what, you are fervent here. Yeah, you, you are fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, Romans 12 from verse 11. You we see it in you. But there are some little, little things we need to do. And this man became so huge that when there were sects in the church, he was one of the sects that was mentioned. It's a bad thing, but it reveals that this man had become a pillar, had become a stronghold. Therefore, we must be careful. In our church, everybody is sound on doctrine. So if you come here and you say something or you say that we'll see you somewhere. But may the Lord give us maturity, O Lord, that we are able to take an Apollos and line him up in the name of Jesus. Now, to my third reason is for ministry effectiveness. You, you can't give beyond what you have. If you are shallow in doctrine, your teaching will be shallow. You, you see, Paul was very clear in telling Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4 from verse 16. Let's read that one. You see? Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Yes. Meditate on these things. Yes. Give yourself entirely to them. Yes. That your progress may be evident to all. Yes. Give yourself. So that, you, you, you see, doctrine is such that. Verse 16. Yes. Take heed to yourself. Yes. And to the doctrine. Yes. Continue in them. Continue in them. Continue in them. Why? For in doing this, yes. you will save both yourself and those who hear you. When we say effectiveness, we say that we mean that you are able to accomplish something you plan to do. It means that you are effective. You are able to end at a desired goal. When you continue in this thing, you will save both yourself and those who listen to you. But what I like so much is the verse 6 of 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's read the verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 6. Yes. Continue in them. Yes. Which have good minister of Jesus Christ. Wow. Nourished in the words of faith yes. and of the good doctrine which you have been, you have carefully followed. In the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. Doctrinal maturity brings ministry effectiveness. But not only that, your character, 
your character is affected by the things you believe in. Your character is affected by the things you believe, you believe in. I was talking to one gentleman for disciple making. And when I started talking to him, but he was giving me some funny, funny responses. So you are very, you say some funny things. I said, oh, this guy, I'm praying for him, I'll get him. His mind will change. So I decided one day to call him. And he was talking and he said that I don't believe in this rapture thing, I don't believe in it. And he, he was saying all manner of things. And at the point, he said in the book of Enoch, and I realized that, oh, this is what he's swallowing. You see, what you believe in affects you. Now, the book of Enoch is not part of the canon, it's not scripture, recognized scripture of the church. And that was the book he was reading. Now there's the book of Enoch 1 and 2. I'm not mentioning so that you go and read. I'm mentioning so that you run away from them. You see, so what goes into you is what comes out of you. A good man, out of the good treasure in his heart, he brings out good things. An evil man, likewise. Let's read it. Luke chapter 6 from verse 45. Luke chapter 6 from verse 45. Yes. A good man, yes. out of the good treasure of his heart, mm -hmm. brings forth good. Out of the good doctrine, sound doctrine in him, bring out good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, yes. brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. I want to add this point, that doctrinal maturity affects your prayer life. Your prayer is the way it is because of the amount of doctrine you have in you. You see, the amount of the word of God in you, your understanding of the word of God, and, and your interpretation of the word of God affects your prayer. So in Isaiah chapter 59 from verse 20, 21, it says, from this is my covenant with them. My spirit which I put in them and my word which I put in the mouth will never depart out of their mouth, nor the mouth of their descendants, nor the mouth of their descendants' descendants. What goes, the amount of doctrine in you affects how you pray. It affects how you commune with God. It affects, it says in Proverbs chapter 28 from verse 9, that he who turns his ear away from the law, from instruction, even his prayer is an abomination to God. Doctrine affects your prayer life. Doctrine affects your prayer life. It affects your prayer life. Now let me pause here. And I wanted us to look at how to build sound doctrine, but we are, we are giving the whole mouth for doctrinal maturity. So subsequent preachers will take it. So now let me zero on today's message. If it were to be that he, he had led his truth. <laughs> Hallelujah. I believe I have time. Now, the sixth basic Bible doctrine is the foundational doctrine. In fact, today Daddy was saying that he can't even really understand why. Ooh. And I said that the writer of Hebrew has disturbed us. So he has put eternal judgment in basic Bible doctrine. Then what is the match? I mean, mental Bible doctrines. And this is the foundational of Christian doctrine. And there are six. It is in Hebrews chapter 6, from verse 1 and 2. It said that we should leave the elementary, the kindergarten teaching of Christ and move on into maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith towards God, on the teaching of baptism, of the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Now I'm trying, we've labored through these doctrines, so I want to point out the most important things in them, and we'll be done for the day. Hallelujah. I want to put repentance from dead work 
and faith towards God together so that we can run fast. In both repentance from dead works and faith towards God, there are six things that are involved. Anytime you are talking about repentance from dead works, faith towards God, these are the six things. There is the mind, your head. There must be a change. If it is about repentance from dead work, there must be a change of mind. So in Luke chapter 15 from verse 19, you, uh, uh, um, the prodigal son came back to his senses. There was a change of mind. The, the, the God of this age, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, 4, 4 has blinded, blinded the mind of unbelievers that the light of the gospel cannot shine. So when the light comes, a mind must be changed. So when it comes to faith towards God, it is about knowledge of the word of God. In Romans chapter 10 from verse 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. The second thing that happens in both of them is your heart. Your heart. There must, you must feel sorry when it is repentance from dead, dead words or repentance from sin. And with faith, you must believe. In Acts chapter 2, let's look at Acts chapter 2 from verse 7. Maybe we shouldn't read it so that I can move far. When they heard the words of uh, Peter, they were cut to their heart. When you are cut to their heart, you feel sorry for what you have done. Then you are in the process of repentance. When it is about faith, you actually believe the word. So in Romans chapter 10 from verse 9, it says that with the, with the, you confess the Lord Jesus and then you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You believe in your heart. You see, so that is for the heart in terms of faith. Now, your will, your will, your will, your will must be involved in repentance. You must decide like the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 verse 18. He decided. Let's read that one. He took a decision. Let's li listen to the decision. Luke chapter 15 from verse 18. From verse 18. Yes. And I read. Yes. I will arise and go to my father. I will. I will arise and go. This is a decision making point. And okay. he will say to him. Yes. Father, yes. I have sinned against heaven and before you. I have sinned against. There must be a will. Let's move to faith. With faith towards God, you must decide within you that you take God at his word. Well. The one I like is Luke chapter 5 from verse 5. Then Jesus came to them to cast the, the net. And Peter said that, we thought the whole night, but we have caught nothing. But at your word, but at your word, but at your word, we will do this. That is a decision-making point. The next stage is the Holy Spirit. There's a role of the Holy Spirit in both repentance from dead men and in faith towards God. Now, the Holy Spirit, if it is repentance from dead men, He comes to give conviction. He convicts you of sin. So in John chapter 16 from verse 8, it says that the Holy Spirit, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So the Holy Spirit comes to take over your conscience. Your conscience becomes much sharper than the average human being. And he points out to you long before the temptation even arises that you are about to fall. So watch it. Hallelujah. With faith towards God, time will not allow us to read the reader of Zarephath and Elijah. If, if before Elijah actually went, God put in her heart. So that, that faith was given, it, it was put in her heart. There is a role of the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8 from verse 15 to 16. It says, when we call out our Father, the Spirit bears with, us, with our spirit that we are children of God. It's the Holy Spirit who also gives faith. The next one is what I call your mouth. Your mouth. Your mouth. You must confess. So if it is repentance from dead weeks, it is 1 John chapter 1 from verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. When it is about faith, he says that the word is near us. It is in our mouth. In Romans chapter 10. Let's read from verse 8. Romans chapter 10 verse 8. Yes. But... But what does it say? Yes. The word is near you. It's near you. In your mouth. It is in your mouth. And in your heart. And in your heart. You must declare the word of faith. It's not enough to know it. It's not enough.
to believe it. It's not enough to decide to take God as a way. It's not enough for the Holy Spirit helping you. It's not enough until you confess it. Until you confess it. The last, the seed one is action. I call it action. Tell your neighbor, action. Action. So the action, if it is about repentance from dead works, you must go through restitution. You must pay back. You must try in a way that we want to just pay back. Let's read the Acts chapter 19 from verse 19. The people, magician with magic, they brought the magic books and other things and they paid it. Acts chapter 19 verse 19. Yes. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together yes. and bent them in the sight of all. Yes. And they counted up the value of them and, and it totaled 50,000 pieces. Also. Wow. So if you have repented, why are you still keeping that mobile phone? If you have repented, why are you keeping somebody's laptop? If you have repented, why is it that they, 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 that you say you just walk? It's not like you want to take it, you are walking, but the thing just jump into your pocket. Why you can't you remove it and give it back to the person? With faith, James chapter 2 from verse 17 says that faith without works is dead. You have faith. You have faith for something and you are not taking the step. Hallelujah. You are in the house having faith. <laughs> you must take an action. You must do a work to support the faith that you have. Now, within this short time, I have handled two basic Bible doctrines. That's good. I'll brush through the rest. Whatever the time gets, I'll just stop. The next one is the doctrine of baptisms. The doctrine of baptisms, we have five different kinds of baptism in the Bible, in the scriptures for us. The first one is the baptism of repentance. This was done by John in Matthew chapter 3 from verse 11. He says that me, I baptize you with water into repentance. So that's the baptism of repentance. Today, we don't practice it. Hallelujah. So that's the first one. The second one is the baptism of regeneration or baptism into the body of Christ. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 12 from verse 13, he said that from one spirit we've all been baptized into one body. That baptism stands for our union in the body. And that's when you take your place at the, in us. As a member of the body of Christ, you join. This is why you can't be a believer and you don't have a local church that you fellowship with and you work in. You, you are baptized into the body of Christ. Then we have the third type of baptism, which we call Christian baptism, or what we normally call water baptism. In fact, in the same Matthew chapter 3 from verse 11, it says, The one who is coming after me, whose sandals I can't even carry, he will baptize you. No, sorry. I was Matthew chapter 28 from verse 19. He said that you shall baptize, baptizing them in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is water baptism. So in the same Matthew chapter 3 from verse 16, Jesus himself came and he was baptized and he came out of the water. So this is water baptism or what we call Christian baptism. The, third, the fourth one was what I was mentioning earlier in Matthew chapter 3 from verse 11. That's the Holy Spirit baptism. Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 24 from verse 49, Jesus said that now I send you the promise of my Father, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. That's why in Acts chapter 2 from verse 1, the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all filled by the verse 2. This is Holy Spirit baptism. Now the fifth one is baptism into suffering. Baptism into suffering. It is that destined, planned, arranged suffering that heaven has designed for you so that it will produce a, a quality in you. It, it will bring a testing of your faith. So in James chapter 1 from verse 3, it says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and tribulations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, produces endurance. This is the doctrine of baptism. Now, laying on of hands. How many minutes? Laying on of hands. This is 
a Christian doctrine where hands are laid to transfer blessing, to commission people of God to, to, to impact spiritual gift to, for the Holy Spirit baptism for healing. Blessing we remember in Genesis chapter 48, we will not read it from verse 14 where Jacob blessed Ephraim and Manasseh and that was, that's for blessing. Then we have commissioning in, in Acts chapter 6 from verse 6, when after they had selected the first deacons of the church, they laid hands on them and prayed for them. When they commissioned the apostles in Acts chapter 13 from verse 3, they laid hands upon them and sent them on their journey. This is for commissioning. In fact, for healing, in Mark chapter 16 from verse 18, he says that they will take a serpent, they will drink of poison, and they will, it will not hurt them, and they will lay hands upon the sick, and they will be well. Holy Spirit baptism in Acts chapter 19 from verse 6, in fact, from verse 9, it makes Paul met some disciples and he spoke to them and realized that they were not really, they were not properly baptized. And he baptized them, and in verse 6, he laid hands on them. And the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. This, this impartation in 1 Timothy chapter 4 from verse 14, Paul, Paul was telling Timothy, do not neglect the gift of God which is in you that you receive by prophecy and by the laying on of hands by the eldership. This, this is why we lay hands. And then we have resurrection of the dead. Resurrection of the dead is basically saying that when human beings die, they will resurrect. They will resurrect whether into eternal, um, eternal life or eternal condemnation. The last, the last one is the eternal judgment. Eternal judgment. And this one is saying that God is going to give his final verdict to all of his creation. And that is eternal judgment. Maybe we can read these few verses. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's read from verse 13 to 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. Yes. Each one's work will become clear. Yes. For the day will be clear mm -hmm. because it will be revealed by fire. It will be revealed by fire. Your work will be revealed by fire. So the fire will test each one's yeah. work. Yes. Of what sort it is. Mm -hmm. If anyone's work which he has built on is endured, he will receive a reward. Yes. If anyone's work is bad, he will suffer loss. Yes. But he himself will be saved. Yet so as to fight. Hallelujah. Let's be on our feet. 